All right, grab some tea. The patch notes are here. I've looked through uh, not even half of this, I don't think, but uh, I'm just going to mostly scroll through here, give an overview of things, provide my commentary on it. I listened to the reveal stream earlier, watched the big reveal of things, and all of that jazz. No explicit reaction to that, but uh, mostly just looking at the patch notes here as it pertains to the continual change that comes into the game every few months. So let's get into it, I guess, from the beginning here. Um, top down, I guess is how we'll go. So Crucible, quick overview for that. I definitely recommend looking at the, the reveal yourself, videos of it, and taking a look at that. But quick gist of it is weapons and shields get their own skill tree that can vastly improve the item. And this will have, I think we saw between two and five depth. So possibility for quite a bit of branching. Chris mentioned there would be respecking of the, the weapon skill tree and all that. And then the high end is you can apply the same thing to unique weapons, only non-unique weapons by default. And you can later kind of recombinate them in the end game to potentially combine two very powerful skill trees on an item into one super powerful one. So very interesting stuff. He also said normal item rules apply in that if you want to chance an item on a base or a chance a base item with a good skill tree it has a chance of becoming a unique. So keep an eye out for that possibility as well. I don't think that's going to be worth it, but I'm sure somebody will do it and make like a, you know, an influenced, uh, unique with a super cool skill tree or something, and it'll be a crazy item. So they're adding some new Vol skills, Vol Absolution, Animate Weapon, Arctic Armor, Domination. Hang on. Do domination is Dominating Blow? Must be. Vol Firestorm, Ice Shot, Lightning Arrow, Reap, and Rejuvenation Totem. So they went over some of these on stream. They look pretty cool. Uh, I'm more interested in the utility skills than the more active main skills. Especially because uh, Chris mentions that the Vol skills are intended to be a power boost for those specific skills, but it's more difficult to obtain a 2120 Vol skill than just a 2120 non Vol skill. So if you have to drop down to a 2020 to use the Vol version, you're inherently downgrading your power to pick up the Vol skill, which is sometimes worth it, sometimes not. Arctic Armor especially looks interesting because it gives you a huge defensive benefit. We'll have to see how it is in practice, but it definitely makes Arctic Armor as a skill, a reservation skill, a lot more enticing. Uh, three pairs of Atlas Gateways to the Atlas Passive Tree. This is huge. There's one near the altar affecting notables, one in the middle, kind of like where Stream of Consciousness is, and one a little bit below that, I believe basically allows you to jump from that point to the other side of the tree. So if you want to run Expedition while you do Searing Exarch Altars, that was a massive pain before because you spent a lot of points walking across the tree, and now that's much less of a thing. Okay, they mentioned these on stream, but first time I'm reading these. Snipe, channel up, channel to charge up your bow gaining stages. At least to trigger one supported bow skill for each stage gained. If there are no supported skills, but at least one stage is gained, the skill will fire its own arrow instead, cannot be used by totem. Interesting. This is, uh, th there's kind of a thing already like this from a unique helmet, right? A Salem, is that what it is? Uh, similarly at least, but sounds interesting. I don't, I'm not sure what kind of application this will have. They specifically mentioned the early game being shaken up a little bit by some of these new, uh, sports. So let's get into those as well. Mana Forged Arrows, Dex Int, Support Gem. Supports bow attack skills, causing them to trigger when you spend an amount of total mana on other bow attacks. Based on the supported skills mana cost. Okay. 
Support skills deal more damage based on their mana cost. That is very interesting. Huh. Yeah, I can already... The, the gear's are already turning on this one. So it's a, a new way to trigger bow attack skills. Yeah, that certainly sounds interesting and something I'm looking forward to digging into. Prismatic Burst supports attacks, causing them to trigger the Prismatic Burst spell. Cannot support triggered attacks or attacks used by things other than you. Cannot modify the skill's minions. Prismatic Burst chooses an element at random and deals damage of that type in an area. Having higher strength makes it more likely to choose fire. Dex more likely to choose cold and more likely to choose lightning. Okay, interesting. I wonder if this will have the benefit from the wild strike and elemental hit bonuses, uh, or jewels rather, that allow you to force an element or get rid of an element is more like. Uh, I would assume so based on the fact that it's a prismatic skill. But it's interesting that Prismatic Burst is a spell. Hmm, yeah. Very interesting on this one, especially with some of the Saboteur changes, because it's triggered for reasons we'll get into uh, later down the line. Ten unique items, five new divination cards. Okay, interested to see what those are. I wonder if we'll ever get a card for the Apothecary in the same way that we have a card for the Doctor in The Nurse. That would certainly be interesting, but it's kind of an obvious way to go, but something I would like to see personally. Uh, stack size increase from 10 to 20 for Elks, Vols, Chaos, Tainted Chaos, Eldritch Chaos, and Veiled Chaos. Something people have been asking for, a pretty simple one. Items now persist in a vendor's shop for multiple levels, so that you have a chance to buy them before they vanish. Each time you level up, the oldest items are removed and some new ones are added. You can now rarely find rare items at vendors. Okay. That, that's something that you kind of like know based on feeling, but I haven't really thought about the fact that there aren't any rare items in the vendors. They're all either normal or magic. So that'll be nice and interesting to see um, what kind of impact that has. I personally like this change a lot because, especially early on, I don't like muling for movement speed boots or something. I'll just check the vendor. And sometimes you're at an awkward stage where you don't want to use a portal because you don't have portal scrolls. So you're waiting for the next waypoint and then you level up again and didn't get to check the vendor. So that'll help mitigate that, I think. League revamps. Breach and Abyss. They revealed this on stream as well. Uh, um, the big thing here is they're getting rid of the three middle breach stones, upgraded ones, and raising the low level standard breach stones up to level 81. I like this change a lot because the low level breach stones kind of felt like a waste of time. You know, you kind of just ran them for the sake of invitations or whatnot. Or in my case, I did a bunch of power leveling in like the early levels, but then you quickly outpace that because even though they give 100% increased XP, during level 70, so this will be a lot nicer longer term because I think 81 is beyond the cutoff past which you get diminished experience. And you can also now upgrade those into pure breach stones with blessings, which they have made rare as noted here. Oh, they're called flawless breach stones, not pure, my bad. And they no longer drop from maven invitations. They also can't drop blessings or unupgraded breach uniques. They would drop the upgraded breach uniques instead. The number of breach splinters dropped by breach bosses in your map has been reduced. Interesting, probably to account for the above. Number of breach splinters dropped are now affected by increases in reductions to item quantity. Maybe that means in general, maybe that means just map quantity. It would be interesting to, it's an interesting implication that that might work with player quantity you know, running around in the build with 40, 50, 70 increased item quantity to get a lot more breach splinters would be interesting. They have updated them to be more fast paced, more dangerous in the sense that 
towards the end it tapers off and you're kind of like moving on to the next thing before it closes and now they've reduced the duration and basically increased the pace breach feels more dangerous as time goes on instead of less which i think goes a long way to make it feel like it actually should if that floods betrayal research safe house rewards are now map device crafting options that can be used on breach stones that is very interesting so instead of just the one upgrade since there's an easier way to do that assuming the blessings aren't too rare the more modifiers to breach stones that'll be interesting i wonder what those could be then fortification looks like they nerfed this slightly map contains four additional breaches instead of five I'm not even sure that's significant enough to have made that change, but okay. Splinters obtained from other content has been reduced. I think that's fine. I'd much rather see more of the League's content come from the League mechanic itself. They nerfed the otherworldly artifacts, used to give half a percent chance for rare monsters to drop a blessing, and a 100% increased chance to drop a breach unique, now it's 50% chance and they replace the Blessing Chance with 20% increased density. I think that's probably fine. I think, apart from the Blessing stuff, which is obviously a nerf, because I want the Blessings to be more rare, the Unique Chance is less nerfed than it looks, because this now comes with more density, and the Breaches are more dense naturally, like as a baseline. So unless they also mess with the drop rates in another way, which they definitely could have, that 50% isn't as far below as the 100% as it might look. Within their grasp, which was the recently introduced but kind of convoluted Breachstone Atlas passive, now is much simpler in that Breachstones drop to a 5% chance to be flawless, and they have a 4% chance to drop a Breachstone instead of 12%, but obviously those Breachstones are worth a lot more because they're significantly higher level. Uh, the Flash Breach does not have the increased density on it, and now it's only 10% faster instead of 50, presumably because 50% would be insane with the speed they already gave it naturally. And they added a counterpart one next to it for breaches to open and close 30% slower. So interestingly enough, you could do something like take both of these if you want them slower but not completely slower, if that makes sense or if you're doing like a grand design type strategy. Oh yeah, they nerfed the breach uh, passive that gives you increased chance to spawn a boss and double splinters. Now it's only 20% increased chance to contain a boss instead of 70 and 20% chance to double instead of 100%. And keep in mind, they already reduced the amount you get from bosses. But again, this is all because Compared to before, you're getting pure breach stones. The breach stones are a lot better than before, so before everybody's up in arms about, oh, oh, breach got nerfed significantly. The reason is because breach got buffed. So personally, I like it a lot better, even if it did turn out to be a slight nerf, just on the principle that I think it keeps the new player experience clean as Ziggy D was discussing on the stream. People are interacting with breach and specifically breach bosses later now after this change than before, which is good because there's a lot to take in as a new player. And it's good because, again, those low-level breach zones were not really of significant value until later in the game anyways, where you're doing like a invitation farm type strategy. The boss duplication is now only 50% instead of 100%. It's kind of unfortunate. I like the double bosses, but... Oh well, I guess. The Bargain and the Eye of Terror Divination cards have been disabled. They gave the mid-level Breach Stones that have been removed. Breach Scarabs have been reviewed to account for these changes. Rusted, still one additional Breach. Polished is now one Breach. Cause Breaches in the area to contain an additional Breach Boss's Clasped Hand. These are buffed. The Clasped Hands that, I, that is... Oh, that is clasped is a hard enough word to say to begin with before you start introducing a bunch of other S sounds, so moving on. Gilded Breach Scarabs are still one additional Breach. 
two addition or one additional class to hand, and hands drop double splinters. Okay, that's interesting. And winged is two additional reaches, and otherwise the same benefit. Double splinters from hands, one additional boss's hand. Here we go, updates to uniques. Looks like some buffs. Red Dream used to give 5% of fire as extra chaos, now 6 to 10%. Red Nightmare, the upgraded version of that, similarly, and used to give fire or Ellie res in radius at 35%, uh, added as block attack damage. That was the most horrible way to word that, but now it's 50%. It looks like they're losing the charge gain on kill, which I think is fine. I personally don't like that stat very much anyways, except in cases where you're playing like a weird trickster build where you get the increased charge duration and you can get 40 second long charges and that's, you know, enough to kill a map boss with full charges up or whatever. So I'm not really too sad about it losing that if we get buffs like we're getting here. So similarly for the green nightmare, Cold Resin Radius, or Ellie Res, now gives Spell Suppression at 70%. Used to be 50, and that was pretty good. Definitely usable in the uh, Jewel Socket just south of the Scion, if you wanted to pick that up. I mean, it's kind of in the area, same area as a lot of other Spell Suppression anyways, but I think there are others, some other good spots for this, and at 70%, it's pretty good. And Blue Nightmare up to 50% from 35 lightning res as spell block. This is an interesting lateral move on Severed in Sleep. They took away the chance to chaos the minion damage. Now gives level 25 envy, same as before. Minions have a chance to inflict withered and critical strike multi per withered debuff. That's certainly interesting. And United in Dream, that should be up Greater version, the take away minion leech against poison enemies and the minion damage. So it is a nerf overall, quite a big one at that. I think it's just no longer the obvious choice for a poison based minion build. They kind of flipped around the anticipation and the surrender. The anticipation now gets armor if you've blocked recently, the surrender no longer does. Uh, they increase the life recovery on block as well. Looks like they nerfed the infinite pursuit and buffed the red trail no i guess infinite pursuit is probably not really a nerf cannot be poisoned while bleeding yeah okay that's definitely a buff uh bleeding on you expires 75 percent slower while moving and can't be stunned while bleeding so basically they were self bleed boots before and now they are more into that niche they buffed the Ulnatal's Axe by quite a bit, it looked like. Increased physical damage and Volmon hit is guaranteed. Exerted attacks deal 200% increased damage. That seems pretty amazing, just straight up. This seems like they're going a similar way as a lot of other changes they made last league in that these will most likely be rarer than in previous leagues. They will be better. So hopefully that's the case, and I'm perfectly fine with that type of design philosophy. I think it's good when we get less, you know, piles of garbage uniques and a smaller quantity of uniques that are actually usable. And speaking of Zoff's inception here, look at this. 200 to 300 life gain per enemy, ignited enemy kill instead of 20 to 30. That is quite a lot, and way higher fizz damage than before. Projectiles pierce all burning enemies. Arrows deal 30-50% to 50 added fire damage for each time they've pierced. Don't know if that includes the time that they pierce the enemy. Like, if I'm damaging an enemy with a piercing shot, is that one pierce or zero pierce? Not sure. Formless Flame now has minus... 100 to 200 fire damage taken from hits. Pretty interesting. That is, it, it's specific to fire damage, but that is quite hefty in terms of damage reduction uh, against, you know, mobs of enemies. Formless Inferno, 
got its like core mod removed, armor is increased by overcat fire res, and kind of gets another weird one instead. Minion life is increased by overcat fire resistance. Socketed skills are supported by level 30 Infernal Legion. Okay, very interesting. It's another one of those that is just different. So I'm curious to see how people work that out. Level 30 is a lot. I don't know how that scales. Let me look at it real quick. Yeah, level 30 Burning Legion is close to four times the damage of a level 20. That's pretty insane. 7856 base fire damage per second. And this is, yeah, they take 40% of their max life as fire damage. So I don't know if the minion life is supposed to be um, an upside or a downside, really. I mean, this, so this is a five link, right? For the Formless Inferno. You socket a minion here with three other sports, gets a fifth link of level 30 Infernal Legion. Maybe they, the obvious intention is something like minion instability, where they're going to die just as fast because Infernal Legion is percentage based, but they have a lot more life, so they explode for more damage. I kind of like that idea. The more I think about it, seems kind of interesting. Zoff's heart now has nearby enemies are covered in ash instead of requiring them to hit you first. Nice change. Toolborn no longer has cast speed or damage to spells per power charge. Instead, it gets the equivalent of like 8 to 10 power charges worth of spell damage all the time. And cold exposure you inflict applies an extra minus 12 to cold res. That's going to make it pretty competitive for any hit-based cold skill, I feel like. And then the upgraded version has 50 to 70 flat damage per power charge, but it loses the increased cold damage per frenzy charge. I guess the, the power charge thing is probably a bit better than frenzy charges if you're going for that type of build, but yeah, they're, they're definitely shaking these up quite a lot. I didn't expect to be staying in this section of the patch notes for so long, honestly. Okay, looking at the next pair, the Snowblind Grace and the Perfect Form, these make it seem like they're, I mean, it kind of already seemed like this, but it seems like what they're going for is they don't want the upgraded version to be strictly better, but different or with different application, it seems. So the Snowblind Grace now has, it loses the evasion by overcapped cold res and spell suppression it had. Now it has increased dexterity, 50% increased Arctic Armor buff effect, used to be 25, and Arctic Armor has no reservation. That used to be on the perfect form, but now the perfect form loses the increased dexterity, the Arctic Armor Reservation, and life now has a ton of extra evasion rating compared to before, and 50% chance to suppress spell damage. That is an obscene amount of spell suppression. So again, just different. You know, if you can get spell suppression, they're on the same base type now, Zodiac Leather. So if you want to use Arctic Armor, you can use the Snowblind Grace, not upgrade it, and you're going to have a 50% stronger Arctic Armor for free versus Spell Suppression, because maybe you get that Spell Suppression on your gear or on the tree. The Halcyon Unique Am Amulet loses cold damage and gains Freeze Proliferation, which seems really good. Yeah, I like it. Oh, snap. Check this out. Hand of Thought and Motion Unique Claw. It's now in the Imperial Claw base type. No longer adds flat lightning damage or 1 to 5 lightning damage to attacks per 10 intelligence. Now has, basically, as the Hand of uh, Wisdom and Action had before. Hang on, let me double check this. Yeah, okay, so they moved a lot of 
what was on Wisdom in Action over to Thought in Motion. So you don't need to upgrade it to get those benefits that you were getting before. It's got the 1 to 10 lightning damage. It doesn't have LE damage with attacks or attack speed. Uh, it now has dexterity, int, the 1 to 10, like I said, per 10 dexterity. Wait, 10 dexterity? Okay, hang on a minute. That is very interesting because, you can look over here, this is 1 to 10 int, 1 to 10 lightning damage per 10 int. If this isn't a typo, and I'm assuming it's not because it's just that interesting, that means you use Thought in Motion for a dex stacking build for lightning damage. And then it has 5% increased crit per 25 intelligence. Or you can upgrade it, and that lightning damage is coming from your intelligence now. That definitely seems interesting. And then it's got, uh, this would have, instead of the crit chance per int, would have the attack speed per dex. This isn't, uh, this 5% is pretty small, by the way, because that is not local to the weapon. It's conditional, so that means it is global, if you're unaware of that rule of thumb. Esh's mirror now has uh, more energy shield, doesn't have shock reflection or life, and it has shock proliferation. Yeah, kind of meh on that one, personally. Voice of the Storm Unique Amulet no longer triggers a level 12 lightning bolt when you deal a critical strike, or has crit chance increased by overcap lightning res. Instead, 50% increased lightning damage, and lightning damage with non-critical strikes is lucky. Interesting. I mean, that is a mastery passive, so I don't know how useful that'll be, unless you really don't want to go out of your way to get that mastery passive. And then the Choir now triggers level 30 lightning bolt when you deal a critical strike. That is very hefty compared to level 12 before. Abyss got some great updates. Abyssal Depths now always contain a Lich. You no longer have to go in and check the loading screen to see if it is or not and then leave. If you get an Abyss, it's always a boss or a Depths. Um, yeah, Abyssal Depths are now rarer than before. Basically, you'll it sounds like you'll encounter the same number of liches, but a lower amount of abyssal depths. And Stygian Spire, in place of where it was before, in the depths, will now spawn in place of an abyssal trove sometimes. Then it drops all the jewels and other items you would normally obtain, plus a Stygian vice. Abyssal depths can now only appear in level 78 or above areas. Interesting. I kind of like that change for the same reason as the breach situation. And they always spawn at the fourth hole if they were going to spawn at all. That's really nice because if you build around Abyss before this, you're in an awkward situation of you can build up in such a way, take passives that guarantee the fourth hole, but have that cut short by the fact that you get an Abyssal Depths. So it kind of take away, takes away some of the feels bad factor. They made the bosses more difficult. It's one of the main things they mentioned on stream about this change. Should be interesting seeing how much of a difference it is, but they were pretty much just pushovers before. They're in a se separate area with no map mods, so I definitely think they could stand to be stronger than what they were. The depths chance passive is now 100% chance instead of 50, presumably to help offset some of the difference that's made there. Lightless Legion no longer gives more mobs in Abyssal Depths. Instead, it has Stygian Virus in your map drop items with plus one to level, so still a good source of item level 86 Stygian Vises, as they mentioned on stream. Holy crap, this is an insane change. The Shroud of the Lightless Unique Body Armor no longer has 6 to 10% increased life, 9 to 15% mana, or elemental penetration support. Instead, it now has 3% increased max life, 3% increased max mana, and penetrate 4% elemental resistances. 
per abyss jewel affecting you. Read that again. That's every abyss jewel you have socketed, giving you 3% life, 3% mana, 4% elemental penetration. That is obscene. If you're using, you know, obviously you have to hit a critical mass, but compared to before, this is a lot better. You have to socket quite a few things to hit a breakpoint as before, but I much prefer things that are scalar, but weaker at the low end than things that are flat like before. I like the ability to be like, okay, you know what? I'm making a build with 20 Abyss Jewels in it, you know? Just go full ridiculous on it and be rewarded with that or by doing so with 60% increased life and mana and 80% Ellie pen. That's just ridiculous. There are also now two and three Abyssal Socket versions of Shroud of the Lightless. Tomb Fist Unique Gloves no longer have 46% life. Now it's 5 to 10% attack speed as it did before can now roll two random modifiers that require a specific Abyss Jewel socketed from a pool of six modifiers, previously two set modifiers. Okay, so similar to, well, okay, not really like the boots, but similar to some other items we've seen in the past. I'm interested to see what those mods might be. Light Poacher now longer has 4% life on kill when you use it, or life when you lose a spirit charge. It has a 100% chance to gain a spirit charge on kill, up from 15 to 20, 5% of physical damage as extra damage of each element per spirit charge. What is the max spirit charges? I forget. That it's the max of, it's max is the number of abyss jewels you have, I think. That is, so each abyss jewel you have 15% fizz as elemental. That is... That, there, that's all... I, I don't even know what to say about that. That seems like a lot. Again, in the aforementioned meme build of... You run 20 abyssals. Obviously, that was highly inflated. So you have 10 abyssals. You're getting 50% fizz as extra damage of each element. That is much more realistic, especially if you're running like a Darkness Enthroned, which now instead of being a static 75%, 50 to 100% increased effect of socketed abyss jewels. So again, you're using these jewels and trying to stack a bunch. You put your two best ones in the belt. They have double effect. Yeah, I'm definitely envisioning a build. I might run some of this this league. Kind of sad that it's probably going away in the map device though or wait was it on the map device that was breach that was on the map device wasn't it bubonic trail is losing its movement speed life and 10 percent damage per type of abyss jewel affecting you that's 24 to 32 percent movement speed while affected by a magic abyss jewel 40 to 60 percent reduced duration of elemental ailments on you while affected by a rare abyss jewel holy crap 16 to 24 percent increased reservation efficiency while affected by a unique abyss jewel i like it the last one in particular is very powerful that's a lot of reservation efficiency the ailment duration is good ish but it's more of the fact that you're probably gonna have a rare abyss jewel anyways so it's kind of like a nice to have thing. I don't like reduced duration of ailments as a means of mitigating them just because ground effects, basically, or things of that nature. Like if you have 100% reduced duration of shock on you, if you're standing on shock ground, that makes you take 50% increased damage. You're still shocked for that 50% with 100% reduced duration. So it's kind of like my least favorite way of mitigating elemental ailments right now. But I kind of like the flavor of it, even if it doesn't turn out to be particularly good or meta or whatever. I just kind of like it. 
they doubled the values of Tekrod's gaze. Uh, I don't know if anybody ever used that, but <laughs> if they did, it is now literally twice as good as before. So that's something. Uh, Abyss Scarabs have changed. They have, uh, looks like reduced the amount of increased monsters, some Stygian Spire stuff, not too big of a deal. The usual Atlas map shift up. Uh, let's see, any interesting ones here? Belfry's all right. Race course is decent these days. Maybe decent for boss rushing. Tropical Islands, been a while since I've done that map. They haven't gotten rid of Crimson Temple or anything like that. Don't know if they got rid of Haunted Mansion. Ran that quite a lot this league, looks like not. So, yeah, the usual shakeup, I'd say. Nothing major here. Endgame changes. Add a new series of profane modifiers that can roll on maps, logbooks, delve biomes, and heist contracts. Modifiers cause monsters to deal extra physical damage as chaos. Cause monsters to inflict withered for two seconds on hit. Chaos res just got a lot more important. Eldritch Alter modifier that causes you to have reduced cooldown recovery rate per power charge has been replaced with one that causes you to have reduced crit multi per power charge. Okay, I kind of like that. It's more in theme, I guess. The cooldown recovery rate was always kind of weird and like globally punishing. If your build had power charges for whatever reason, I like the reduced crit multi a lot more. And this is one I suspected they might get rid of. The Maven's Invitation Item Quantity Atlas Passives no longer each provide 3% increased quantity of items found in the Maven's Crucible. They now each provide a final map boss in each map, has 8% increased chance to drop a Maven's Invitation. Number of Crescent Splinters dropped from the Maven Invitations has been slightly increased to account for this change. So, last patch, they got rid of some of the things that you could spec into before running a bunch of boss or guardian maps because they said it felt bad and they didn't want people to feel like they had to spec into those things before running a bunch of those maps. This was still the case because when you ran invitations, this quantity, there are six of these nodes, so 18% quantity in total. And the way splinters work is you want to hit a certain breakpoint of quantity on your invitation to hit a certain number of splinters that you're going to get. You know, an Elder Slay invitation after a certain point is going to give you five splinters. A little bit more than that, you're basically guaranteed six. So what you could do is you could run your normal maps as you're building up the invitation, doing Maven Witness stuff. You would have those six 3% nodes allocated and one floating point from your Atlas passives. When you did the invitation, you would spec into Wandering Path. So your notables don't matter anymore, but you wanted them to for normal mapping, which is why you unallocated Wandering Path. But you allocated in to get a plus 18%. Because those notes total up to 18%, and now they're doubled from Wandering Path. And so it kind of felt mandatory in a similar way, except it was much jankier than the previous keystone that was there. So that makes sense to me, and I kind of like this as a solo cell phone player. It means you can more reliably get invitations, because that's going to total up to, assuming they kept the same number of them, 48%. Yeah, that's right, there are six nodes, if I can backtrack my math a little bit. So, should be an interesting one. I like the change overall, especially if the increase to the splinter amount is uh, even remotely similar to what it was before. This one's a big one. Harvest crafting option that applies an enchantment to nine unique map, causing it to not consume sextant charges has been replaced with an enchantment for nine unique maps that provides a 50% chance not to consume sextant uses. Weird that they use uses and charges interchangeably. Uh, in game, they're called the uses, I believe. But I always say charges anyway, so who cares, I guess? 
Um, yeah, that basically kills the infinite harvest sextant strategy, which I'm perfectly fine with. I ran it for like 800 maps this league. If you saw one of my previous videos and the amount of Uber Cyrus I was doing. So, yeah, I can't say I'll miss it. Not the type of thing I would want to do all that much again. Um, we'll see if they reduce the cost at all. Because if they don't, that is. <laughs> that craft is like never getting used again because it was already pretty expensive, all things considered. The next note has no real relevance, I think. Replica unique items rewards in Grand Heist won't spawn with more sockets and or links. I think. This is a change they made for Ruthless, but they didn't care all that much about it in the main game. Because, you know, who cares that you found a 5 link in a level 83 blueprint at this point, you know? Maybe people early league start, but it's not a huge deal overall. Whereas in Ruthless, that is kind of game breaking. Mastery changes. These ones are pretty big, and there's already quite a bit of outcry, actually, given that there are some perceived nerfs. So let's get the whole story here. So they tried to rework a lot of the less interesting or less used passive masteries, and they tried to add more where there were fewer of them, so like accuracy. Didn't have that many masteries, and now that has six. They try to aim for six of every, or six options among every mastery, so let's jump into it. And they added some uh, new masteries as well, so. Alphabetically, looks like accuracy. 40% increased accuracy against unique enemies. I guess I won't cover the old ones, but I'll cover the new ones, and if I notice any that are missing, then I'll talk about those. Otherwise, I don't know right offhand most of these, or some of these what they had on them before, so if I miss something, it's probably just because I wasn't as familiar with it. Accuracy. Gain accuracy rating equal to your intelligence. Okay, pretty interesting. Um, you know, int stacking implications there, like hand of wisdom and action. Minion's accuracy rating is equal to yours. That one's very interesting because there aren't that many builds in which you would want to pick up an accuracy cluster that are, you're going to care about your minion's accuracy. 50% increased accuracy rating at close range. These stats are always interesting because, as far as I know, that doesn't impact things that scale with accuracy. It's like damage per accuracy or whatever. Attack speed per accuracy, there are things like that too. I don't think that scales that because... That is your accuracy against an enemy, not necessarily your accuracy rating in a character sheet. Plus 500 accuracy, minus 2 per level. So, up to minus 200 at level 100. I think that's, you know, pretty solid a lot of the time. If you're hurting that badly for accuracy. Armor Masteries, plus 1 armor per 2 strength. Seems interesting, kind of small. Um, there was another mastery for a flat amount of armor that I don't remember right now. I'm pretty sure anyways. Might be misremembering. Some of the normal stuff, the two better ones, or two of the better ones, 30% reduced extra damage from crits and 20% chance to defend with 200% of armor. Those are pretty solid. Now, you may be noticing. Determination Reservation Efficiency not here. They seem to have globally gotten rid of all the mastery options for reservation efficiency. So that is potentially a big hit to a lot of builds, and as some people on Reddit were saying, Pox is going to have a nightmare over this because his guide is finely tuned around that, around that and is it's like the number one question he gets <laughs> regarding his Righteous Fire build. All right, plus one, all maximum resistances, including chaos. If equipped helmet, body armor, gloves, and boots have armor, 
that one's amazing. What more can I say? Very competitive. Kind of, you know, might make you consider picking up another armor cluster. 20% increased armor per second you've been stationary, up to a max of 100. They're really trying to push the stationary stuff. It's kind of a, a situation of if they hit a critical mass of that, maybe it becomes worthwhile. 100% increased armor from equipped boots and gloves. I've never been a huge fan of those types of masteries on the other defenses either. Um, oh, that's what it was. There was one for increased armor from shield, and I think it was 100%. I think I would have been more likely to take that than this boots and gloves one, personally. Armor and energy shield mastery. 2% chance per 5% missing energy shield to defend with 150% of armor. So that's 40% of your missing energy shield. If you have none of your energy shield, 40% chance to defend with 150% of armor, also known as 25% more armor on average. Did I say 20% or 25? I meant 20%. Um, Combined with the armor mastery of the 20% chance to defend with 200%, you're looking at 60% chance to defend with more than your normal amount of armor, which is looking pretty good. Recover 5% of energy shield over one second when you take physical damage from an enemy hit. Could be decent, I suppose. Maybe as like a Righteous Fire Inquisitor type deal makes that more competitive. Now here's an interesting one for like a Righteous Fire Juggernaut, especially. 10% of armor also applies to chaos damage taken from hits. That is amazing. Chaos is was like the main weakness of a juggernaut. So with 8% of your armor applying to elemental damage, 10% applying to chaos, and 100% applying to physical, jug is looking pretty enticing, like even more so than it was before. And it was already pretty good. So that might push me to league start Righteous Fire Juggernaut and play it for the third league in a row just because that is an interesting enough change to me. 100% increased armor and ES from equipped body armor. If equipped gloves, helmets, and boot... (laughs) Gloves, helmet, and boots all have armor and energy shield. Pretty interesting. 10% of physical damage from hits taken as chaos damage. Okay, another uh, big one there. Potentially one there for um, the Transcendence builds, interestingly enough. Hmm, might be something to consider. Uh, Either way, I glossed over this. 100% ES from your body armor is potentially really big. So, not one to sleep on that, but I'm still not the biggest fan of that type of effect. Armor and evasion. Defend with 120% of armor against projectile attacks. 5% more chance to evade melee attacks. I dig it. 80% increased stun and block recovery. That's quite a bit, but you know, normally you try not to get stunned, uh, if anything. Every 4 seconds, okay, this is an interesting one. Every 4 seconds, regenerate life equal to 1% of armor and evasion over one second. Just doing some quick math here. So if you have 30k armor and evasion, it's kind of high to get both of those, times 1%. That's 600 every four seconds for an average of 150 life regen. But it comes in bursts, which can be good or bad depending on the situation. Seems okay. It's definitely, I mean, it's scalar, which is great. So that's going to be a big deal if you're stacking one or both of these things. Probably both because it's the armor and evasion mastery. So if you're something like a champion where you're stacking both or you're using like a skin of the loyal, skin of the lords for the increased defenses and you're scaling off that way or you're a pathfinder with good flasks, I think that might be worth considering picking up an armor and evasion cluster. 
40% increased evasion rating if you've been hit recently, 40% increased armor if you haven't. Okay, nice kind of flip effect there. I'm kind of into it, I just think the other options are a bit better at this point. Uh, immune to poison, if equipped helmet has higher evasion rating than armor. Immune to bleeding, if equipped helmet has armor, higher armor than evasion. I think the bleed immunity is a big one here. You can get kind of functional bleed immunity with the Pantheon, but if you can pick up this effect and get another Pantheon you might like a little better. Could be nice. Attack Masteries. Non-Vol Strike Skills target one additional nearby enemy. They used to just say Strike Skills, I'm pretty sure. They specify non-Vol now. Get adrenaline from one second when you change stance. I don't know how often you can change stance, or how annoying it would be to constantly change, but there is some potential hilarity there. Okay, Blood and Sand has a cooldown of two seconds, so maybe not, but <laughs> I, I like the thought of getting enough cooldown recovery that you just throw your Blood and Sand on a left click. Don't even bother like using the effect, it's just there for the adrenaline. That is definitely infeasible and very funny to think about, though. Monsters can't block your attacks. It's kind of, eh, decent, I guess. 5% increased attack speed per enemy in close range. I don't know how close that close range is, but that's potentially a lot in a clearing scenario. Nearby enemies are intimidated while you have rage. Intimidated enemies take 10% increased damage from attacks, so... 10% more without any other increases. Okay, moving on. Caster Masteries. 25% more spell damage if you've been stunned while casting recently. That one is interesting because if you can manage to get yourself stunned, you can get chance to avoid interruptions from stuns while casting. So if you can work that in, potentially just 25% more damage if you can get it happening consistently enough. 6% increased cast speed for each different non-instant spell you've cast recently. If you're throwing down brands and curses and wave of conviction, this might add up quite a bit. Then the meme, 25% chance to open nearby chess when you cast a spell. <laughs> Just funny, I guess. Did I miss one up here? No, okay. Chaos Masteries. Cover 1% of life per wither debuff on each enemy you kill. Eh, Plus one to maximum chaos res. Okay, pretty interesting. Deal 10% more chaos damage to enemies which have energy shield. You're already stronger against enemies with ES because you ignore their ES with a chaos build. So I don't like that one as much personally. Although, if you ensure an enemy has ES, that means you're just dealing 10% more damage to them. Okay, I'm seeing a potential implication here for like bosses and such. If you roll a boss invitation with enemies have ES, you won't have to go through that, but you will be dealing the 10% more damage. 5% chance to inflict, when you inflict wither, to inflict up to 15 debuffs instead. Interesting. I don't know how much I like it, because if you're hitting quickly enough for that 5% to activate often, you should be able to stack withered effectively anyways. Notably, they got rid of the one that gives you plus one chaos dot multi per 4% chaos res you have. So typically, if you had 72 plus chaos res, that was 18% dot multi potentially being lost for chaos dot builds. Claw Mastery. Gain 15%, 25, 15%? Gain 25 life per enemy hit with main hand claw attacks, 25 mana per offhand. Interesting, they had something similar before without the weird main hand offhand split and with lower values, from what I remember. Or I'm thinking of a notable. Inherent attack speed bonus from dual wielding is doubled while wielding two claws. I think it's 10% more attack speed for dual wielding, so claws would have 20% more with this mastery. 16%, or holy crap, can't read. 60% increased damage with claws against enemies that are on the life. 10% of leech is instant per equipped claw. So 10 or 20% instant leech. 
potentially very powerful. If you get some overleech, that is potential for both high regen and high instant recovery. And it doesn't say leech from claws. So if you really wanted to get a taste of the old Vol Pact, you could just have a claw equipped and pick up this master anyways, but I think there's a way around that that we'll see here shortly. 50% increased stealth if you've hit with a claw recently. That is... <laughs> I don't know if we've seen that stat referenced in such a way before, except maybe phase run. Interesting, though. Claw mastery was not highly used, so I don't really know what was on it before, apart from the elusive thing that I recognize. Cold mastery. They got rid of a lot of these, which is a bit of a shame, because some of them were good. 40% of fizz cold converted to cold. 10% chance to inflict cold exposure on hit. That is probably 10% cold exposure, by the way. It's very often what it is in these situations. Enemies near targets you shatter have a 20% chance to be covered in frost for 5 seconds. Eh, not really useful in a clear speed sense a lot of the time, I don't think. Plus 1% to max cold res. Chills from your hits always reduce action speed by at least 10%. That's similar to what uh, Elementalist has for Shock. I think it has that same thing for Chill, too, but it's not really a node that gets taken. Enemies permanently take 5% increased damage for each second they've ever been frozen by you, up to a maximum of 50%. What? That seems pretty nuts. Because you can still freeze bosses and such, they just don't get the slowing effect fully. Huh. Interesting one there. We'll have to see how that one pans out. Dagger Mastery. Only one new one here. 50% increased projectile speed while wielding a dagger. Maybe for like frost blades or something. Elemental Mastery. Has this got a big shakeup? 50% reduced effective exposure on you. It's kind of meh, but... Yeah, you can just counter that with more res on gear if you're worried about it. Hits have 25% chance to treat enemy monster resistances as inverted. So if they have 75 cold res, 25% chance they have negative 75 instead. Again, pretty interesting. I don't know how practical it is. Critical strikes against you do not inherently inflict elemental ailments. You really don't want to be getting crit anyways, so I don't think that's going to be all that good. 3% and you want to mitigate ailments against non-crits anyways. 3% chance rates to deal 300% of fizz as extra damage of a random element. That equates to 12% more damage, I believe. Uh... I much preferred the old consistent one of 10% as a random element because that's about the same. This one's slightly more powerful and way, way less consistent. They also got rid of the 40% increased effect of non-damaging ailments, which is unfortunate. Energy shield masteries. 10% less physical damage taken while on full energy shield. Don't think that's going to happen much. Stun threshold is based on 60% of your areas. Used to be 50%. 30% of chaos damage taken does not bypass energy shield. That used to be on the evasion ES mastery. 100% increased energy shield from equipped helmet. <clears throat> evasion masteries. Plus 15% chance to suppress spell damage if equipped helmet. Body armor, gloves, and boots all have evasion rating. So a similar one used to be on the... Suppression Mastery, maybe it still is, but for just helmet, gloves, and boots. We'll see if that's still there later. Whoop. Evasion ES Mastery. 20% increase max ES if both equipped rings have evasion modifiers. 40% increased ES recharge rate if amulet has an evasion modifier. Interesting, I could see some applications for both of these. 
I mean, it's one modifier, so still, though, they're conditional, so you won't necessarily have them both. 100% increased evasion rating if energy shield recharge has started in the past two seconds. Hmm, okay. More evasion as you're recovering, yes. It's pretty nice. 1% increased evasion per 5 int. Dex provides no inherent bonus to evasion. Good if you're int stacking, I guess. Um, further incentivizes getting in to scale your energy shield. Every 4 seconds regenerate energy shield equal to 1% of evasion over 1 second. Now this one I like a lot. Because it's not as easy to recover ES as it is to recover life. And again, it's kind of a small amount. If you have 30k um, evasion, you're going to get 300 ES back every 4 seconds. Not much, but it is a burst effect, which again can be decent. Fire Mastery. Oh, they got rid of some of my favorites here. Mostly because my favorites were the good ones. <laughs> Burning enemies you kill have a 3% chance to explode, dealing a tenth of their max life as fire damage. Again, this would be way more fun if it was consistent, but this is like never worth picking up unless you already have an explosion effect, and this would just, you know, add on top of that, but yeah, I'm not a huge fan of this. Might be good for ignite builds to get that extra proliferation going, uh, elementalist in particular. 50% chance to refresh Ignite Duration on Critical Strike. Don't think that's going to be a thing. Generates 1%, or sorry, 1 life per second for each 1% uncapped fire resistance. So if you have 125 fire res and you're capped at 75, you should regen 125 life per second. I think that's pretty decent. Critical Strikes do not inherently ignite. 100% increased damage with hits against ignited enemies. That one actually has potential because I feel like it's easy to fit in ignite or have a supplemental skill that's igniting, and that 100% increased damage is pretty big against uh, enemies you might be igniting. Flask masteries. So, jumping into this, they removed utility flask recharge, you may notice. 25% chance to gain a flash charge when you deal a critical strike. Probably has a cooldown of uh, 1 or 200 milliseconds, rather. And that is a flask charge. This is the same as it was on Pathfinder before, I assume. A flask charge means one of your flasks gains one charge. It's not that good. We already know it's not that good. Enemies you kill that are affected by elemental elements grant 100% increased flash charges. Again, more stuff from Pathfinder because it got reworked. And recover 4% of life when you use a flask. Fortify. Cover 100 life for each fortification lost. I'm not sure that's really what you want. Y you want your fortify to be up longer. There was one for increased duration. There used to be, I'm pretty sure. But there's... You only would want this if you lost fortification on a big hit or something, you know? I feel like you'd just rather have the fortification still. Gain 20 for fortification on melee kill against a rare unique enemy. It's okay, I guess, but duration is probably too short. 2% reduced duration of ailments inflicted on you per fortification. I already talked about that before, that's only 40%. It's not that good. It's not just elemental ailments, so bleed and poison are in play here. So that makes it better, but still not that good. Increased stun and block recovery per fortification. Yeah. 20% <clears throat> chance... Oh, impale mastery. 20% chance to hit, unhit to remove all impales from an enemy. Impales removed this way multiply their reflected damage by this hit by the number of hits they have left. So basically you just front load your impale damage some more. It's kind of interesting, actually. I don't like it's a net zero on damage, but might help with clear. 
and 10% chance on hitting an enemy for all impales on that enemy to last for an additional hit. Ah. Interesting. Kind of into it. Leech Masteries, they redid most of these by consolidation. So increase max total life mana and ES recovery per second from Leech. Those used to be separate. 25% of damage taken recouped as life if Leech was removed by filling unreserved life recently. Ah, okay. That is very interesting. I can see that coming into play. 25% more damage with hits against enemies that cannot have life, life leech from them. How many enemies is that? Can't be that many, right? I don't think it's, there are any like bosses or anything with that major effect. Increased armor and evasion while leeching. And 10% of leech is instant. Like I said before, you won't have to use claws to get that effect. Should be interesting seeing how that shapes up though. 10% isn't a ton, but I think it's enough. Like even in combination with Overleech to again get that like immediate recovery on top of the high overtime recovery. Lightning Mastery. 60% increased crit chance against enemies with lightning exposure. Lightning damage of enemies hitting you while you're shocked is unlucky. Weird. And the up, I see what they did now. The effect that got added to a breach item earlier, making your lightning damage with non-critical strikes lucky, got removed from the lightning master because probably it was the best one. Unsurprising, I guess, in retrospect. Life masteries. Big shake up here. 10% more on maximum life you have at least six ma life masteries allocated. So if you take all of these, you'll have 10% more max life. I'm not sure that's worth it. Unless you know... Oh. Oh, hang on a minute. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, some of these are very interesting, but <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. 15% increase max life if there are no life modifiers on equipped body armor. That might be hard to finesse, because even if you get like life regen, that'll count. Um, potential there, though, especially if you're going after the more max life mastery. You might want to find a way to build around that. You count as low life while at 55% of maximum life or below. Yeah. Um... I don't know how... Let me check how Petrified Blood is worded. Okay, Petrified Blood says your life can't go above low life, but I'm not sure if that raises the low life floor from 50 to 55%, or if it just means you count as low life in that extra 5% range. I'm guessing the latter, based on how it's worded. So I don't think this raises the Petrified Blood situation up to 55%, but who knows? You count as full life while at 90% of max life or above. This one is a bigger deal, I think, because you want to be in that range anyways if you're going for like a full life scenario. So I think that one's going to be pretty good. Then skills cost life instead of 30% of mana cost. So the, the split will be if a skill cost 100 mana before, it'll now cost 70 mana on 100 life. That seems pretty good in terms of reducing the general cost of skills. And especially if blessings are still a thing, that's something I'm considering to be massive. Like, you might not have to go with weird Eldritch Battery shenanigans in order to uh, fit in a Divine Blessing. So I'm curious to give that a shot. Like leave enough of your mana left to be able to pay that cost, then go with some cost reduction, and then you're shifting 30% over to life, which is fine because your life pool is going to be a lot bigger than your mana pool. Link Mastery, I know nothing about links because I play solo cell found, and 
I don't know if you can use links, really, or if you even would, but links take twice as long to break. Break. Links goes linked to one additional random target. Linked targets share endurance, frenzy, and power charges with you. Your movement speed is equal to the highest movement speed among linked players. Sounds interesting. Mana masteries. New regen 5 mana per second that used to require you to have Arcane Surge. Straight up 5% per second is very solid. 12% increased mana reservation efficiency of skills. Okay. So, this is where they took those other effects. I'm going to run some quick math real quick. So, basically, the if I'm thinking about this correctly, the less skills that you had a, a specific reservation efficiency for, the better this change is. So before, there used to be a lot of points that were like, okay, you put in a mastery for armor, get 25% reservation efficiency for determination. You grab an evasion wheel, take 25% reservation efficiency for grace. But then you have some auras that don't have that. And now that this applies globally, the math is going to be different and possibly worse, but not by as much as you might think, assuming you're willing to pick up a mana mastery. And depending on how many things you are picking up before anyways, there are a lot of mana clusters scattered around that aren't that bad to pick up. So... I think this will be a decent change. I'm a fan of this iteration of things. Mines. 5% AoE for each mine. Not a huge deal, really. Marks. Marked enemy cannot regenerate life. Decent. Probably never use it, though. Marked enemy cannot do critical strikes. This is amazing. Because marks don't expire. They can be removed from an enemy during, like, phase shifts and things, but... I think for the most part, you're fighting a boss or whatever. This is pretty solid. Your mark transfers to another enemy when a marked enemy dies. I'm not a big fan of this one. Or the next one, 50% increased accuracy rating against marked enemies. Physical masteries. 10% more maximum physical attack damage. That used to be on daggers. But it's pretty good. Um... Depending on the type of build you're going for, it's better for some than others. So a bleed build prefers this effect because you want high max damage for a bleed build because you can only apply one instance of bleed and it takes the strongest. Um, but still, not a bad damage multiplier overall. Cannot be stunned by hits that deal only physical damage. That's interesting. I wonder how many stunning hits are from purely physical damage. Probably not that many at the high end of maps, because you're going to get Fizz added as other damage, especially now with the new Chaos mod. New hits, or new hits. Hits have a 40% chance to ignore enemy monster physical damage reduction. Okay, instead of Overwhelm, I guess. Plus 6% dot multi for bleeding per impale on enemy up to a max 30% at a baseline I'm kind of confused by that one I don't know a situation when in which you would want to invest in impale maybe you have a support skill that can get automated that will impale things oh wait a minute you could impale something with the new mana forged support gem for bows and you impale them enough by triggering that, that's 30% dot multi. I can see that being good. Poison. It looks like they have gotten rid of 20% increased poison duration, and instead now have enemies poisoned by you cannot deal critical strikes. Just like with the marks, except this one is more applicable for a poison build because you're probably going to be poisoning, like, you know, pretty much everything. So I think that's pretty good. 
Protection masteries. Previously resistance and elemental protection. Oh no. I'm worried. Okay. Corrupted blood is still there. <laughs> uh, 65% reduced effect of withered on you. I don't think you get withered all that often, really. Your elemental resistances cannot be lowered by curses. That's nice, because a lot of the point of curse effect is not having to worry about the elemental resistance reduction. Damaging ailments cannot be inflicted on you while you have already have one... Wait. <laughs> Damaging ailments cannot be inflicted on you while you already have one. Non-damaging ailments cannot be inflicted on you while you already have one. So if you self-chill or self-inflict a damaging or non-damaging ailment, or both, that prevents other ones from being inflicted on you. Do ground effects still apply? I don't remember how the word inf inflicted comes into play here. I don't know though. That one is worth some experimentation, I think. Recovery masteries, these are completely new. Uh, let's see. I, I already started eyeballing the, eye the next one and I'm super excited for it. Recovery mastery. 3% chance to recover all life when you kill an enemy. That's interesting, I guess. Uh, potentially saves you in like a, a rippy map. You know, you take two big combo hits, but this 3% procs because you just blew up a pack and you're back to full. Then again, enough recovery on kill kind of has the same effect. Life recoup effects instead occur over three seconds. That's pretty good, making it significantly more effective. Every three seconds, consume a nearby corpse to recover 10% of life. That's also pretty good. All I have to say about that, nearby enemies have reduced life regen. Uh, I don't know if they removed that from the curse. They might have. Let's see. Life recovery from regeneration is not applied. Holy crap. <laughs> I'm reading ahead of myself again. Every four seconds, recover one life for every 0.1% life recovery per second from regeneration. So... Yeah, that's just bonkers, right? So say you have 10% life regen, but you don't want that for some reason. Maybe you have a lot of leech. Although, I guess they're, they're synergistic, but it'd be weird. Say you have 10% life regen. This is instead going to make you every four seconds recover a hundred percent of your life over one second that seems pretty good I it, this one's a difficult one for the process I guess I like it though and regenerate 50 life per second depending on where these uh, recovery clusters are could be good to pick up early especially for like an RF build as you're leveling or something now, Reservation Masteries, I just peeked at this one. Uh, a lot of them are the same. Uh, was there a sixth one before? I think these five were it. Now there's plus one to all max Ellie res if you have reserved life and mana. Every single one of these patch notes is screaming like, play an RF jug. <laughs> they, there are two, like you're already reserving life as well in an RF jug a lot of the time, because you have enough life that reserving vitality on arrogance isn't a big deal. So yeah, get another plus one all res, why not? You know? So I'm into that. Spell suppression mastery. Inflict fire, cold, and lightning exposure on enemies when you suppress their spell damage. Hmm. I, I still don't like the offensive benefits for getting hit. Prevent plus 1% of suppressed spell damage per hit suppressed recently. Minus 2% chance to suppress spell damage per hit suppressed recently. They went over this on the stream. Basically a way to reward you for over capping 
spell suppression. I think it's kind of risky. If you know for a fact you're not going to be taking too many hits in a four second period, then this could be good, but at the same time, if you're not, then how much benefit are you really getting from this? Would be my question. Suppress spell damage cannot inflict elemental ailments on you. I think that's going to be a big early game, like stopgap measure before you get full elemental ailment immunity. Seems pretty nice, honestly. If you have phasing, you have phasing if you have suppressed spell damage recently. Plus 8% chance to suppress spell damage while phasing. And chance to suppress spell damage is lucky. Again, another kind of filler one for when you are leveling and don't quite have cap suppression yet. Seems nice. Stun Mastery is whole new mastery. 100% chance, 100% increased enemy stun threshold. 200% increased stun duration on enemies. I think that's good for Bone Chatter. The duration, in especially. Oh, increased enemy stun threshold. That's a downside, I see now. Okay, uh, I wonder how that math works out then. 20% chance to gain an endurance charge when you stun an enemy with a melee hit. Pretty good. 50% crit multi against stunned enemies. Hits against you cannot be critical strikes if you've been stunned recently. 25% chance to deal a stunning hit to nearby enemy monsters when you're stunned. Interesting again. Gain adrenaline when stunned for 2 seconds per 100 milliseconds of stun duration. Again, some like self stunning synergies here. I wonder if there's going to be a meme stun caster build where you try to go for the the more spell damage from having your cast interrupted or whatever it said. Trap Masteries. Only new one is 8% chance for traps to trigger an additional time. So it looks like they did a similar thing that they did for Pathfinder for Saboteur. Saboteur lost its 25% chance for traps to trigger an additional time, which, without any other modifier, is 25% more damage. That's a lot to be losing. Here's 8%. Um, there's already 10% on the tree, so that's a total of 18% instead of 35%. But there are diminishing returns on this because it's a chance to double, basically, and that's how that goes mathematically. Oh, let's see. Two into masteries. Ruthless hits intimidate enemies for four seconds. I used, to, I think that used to be on the attack mastery, and they just moved it. Warcry mastery. New warcries cannot exert travel skills. Remove all damaging ailments when you warcry. Warcries have ten percent chance to exert three additional attacks. Hmm. I don't think I'm too excited by any of these. Oh, it says remove masteries down here. <laughs> Okay then. Uh, anything important I missed? All oh, right, this getter bot efficiency on uh, traps is gone. Like everything else, the stun avoidance and curse effect on the protection mastery is not my favorite thing. Uh, yep, here's the mana one. Used to be arcane surge, chaos. What else did I miss here? A oh, withered effect. It's kind of big. These two didn't really matter, and this one will be missed by a lot of people, I think. Uh, let's see. Yeah, the caster masteries. Caster masteries weren't that big of a deal. And yeah, more curse effect on armor and yes. This one was actually pretty big. I've used this before on an RF jug with uh, Devouring Diadem to good effect. Passive skill tree cluster changes. Canix didn't have enough passive tree support, so we decided to add more options. Order to allow more access to the attack mastery. Added a new cluster by the Templar, one in between Ranger and Shadow. Okay. Create more access to other forms of recovery like regen and recoup, so we added some new passive skill clusters. Oh, is there another flat regen cluster, maybe? Let's see. Addition of stun mastery. Uh, let's see. Three new stun clusters. Tweak some existing ones. 
More ways to build upon stun other than stun and block recovery or reduce stun chance. Okay, I like it. Attack clusters. New Righteous Fury cluster has been added to the southwest of Templar's starting location. 10% chance to create consecrated ground on melee kill lasting 4 seconds, and 40% increased melee damage with hits at close range. Powerful Bond has been moved to the passive tree. Moved on the passive tree. That was the link one, I think. I think it got moved north. New multi shot cluster. It's been added to the northeast of the ranger's starting location. Grants attacks, fire, and additional projectile. Really good. Careful conservationist has been moved on the passive tree to make space for this new multi shot. Okay. I saw it in the reveal being in the same spot. And I wonder if it just went away or got moved, but good to know it got moved. Master Fletcher no longer grant provides attack speed with bows, accuracy, or projectile speed. Now has bow attacks, fire, and additional arrow. And that's different than this. So you could get you can get two projectiles for bow skills on the tree now. That's pretty great. Okay, I'm into it. Three small pass passive skills and no longer provide 10% bow damage. Instead, they now provide 5% attack speed with bows. Sounds like those got nerfed. So, less damage, but an additional arrow. I think that's a trade some people are willing to make. Uh, I guess they'll have to now, really. Entry small passive skill for Master Fletcher. No longer has accuracy. Has 12% increased damage with bows instead of 10. Same with damage over time. Okay. A new Winter's Embrace and Glacial Cage Cluster has been added to the northeast of the Witch's starting location. 60% increased freeze duration, 30% increased damage if you shattered an enemy recently. Enemies take 1% increased damage for each second they have been chilled by you up to a max of 10%. So with the mastery, you're talking about 60% increased damage taken. If you chill them for 10 seconds, of course. But if you're fighting a pinnacle boss, it's probably for more than 10 seconds. Assuming you can, you know, freeze them for that amount of time. Okay, nerfed some cold dot multi. Uh, well, okay. They kind of just switched it up a little, I guess. Added a third small passive skill to the Season of Ice cluster, which has 20% increased effective chill. Breath of Rhyme no longer has 50% cold ailment effect. Now has duration of cold ailments. Sucks for chill, but is good for freeze. Now have cold out multi of 5% instead of 6. Uh, let's see. Yep, Fingers of Frost now has enemies chill as they unfreeze. Let's see here. 20% increased effect of cold ailments now instead of now instead provides 20% increased effective chill. Kind of a weird nerf, but okay. Okay, the Rampant Fortify cluster used to have, uh, with the nose leading up to it, 70% increased attack damage with, or damage with attacks, rather, while you have at least 20 fortification. Now it has armor and evasion while fortified, and melee hits have a, which stun have a chance to fortify. Unfortunate. But it's probably mostly nerfed like EA characters. Steadfast now provides plus three max fortification, previously four, and regenerate 0.1% of life per second for fortification. Okay, interesting. Entry small no longer provides. Ah, uh, okay. They moved the max fortification to a small node. There's a new link cluster north of. Templar, northwest of which, where Zealot's Oath used to be, so that got moved closer to Templar. And some other stuff that I assume affects the 12 people that have ever played Lynx. Mark clusters. New Relentless Pursuit cluster has added, added southeast of the Ranger starting location. Increase attack speed if you've cast a Mark spell recently. And 20% or 10 percent increased movement speed if you've cast a mark spell recently. I like it. 
New Expert Hunter Cluster, southeast of Ranger starting location. Expert Hunter grants 20% increased effect to your marks. A lot of stuff in the southeast of <laughs> Ranger, isn't there? Mark the Prey Cluster has been moved to the location of the Arcing Blows Cluster. Okay, that's northeast of Ranger, I believe. Mark the Prey no longer provides increased flash charges. Now his marked enemy has 10% reduced accuracy rating. Three small pass passives have been replaced with two that provide 20% damage with hits and ailments against marked enemy. Arcing Blow Cluster has moved location. Now resides above Ghost Dance. Two small passive skills prior to Mark for Death no longer grant increased damage with hits and ailments or Mark Effect. So they now provide marked enemy grants 20% increased charges. Okay, so some switching up of things there. Small passive skill in the Adder's Touch Cluster provides Dagger, Critical Strike, Multi, and Poison Duration. Now it's 5% Poison Duration instead of 10. More Poison Duration nerfs in Fatal Toxins and Swift Venoms. Makes sense. It seems like they're targeting Poison Duration. Recovery Clusters. Surge of Vigor added to the northwest of the Templar starting location. Provides every four seconds. Regenerate 15% of life over one second. So that's like almost 4% per second effectively. 3.75 per second. That's pretty hefty. Um, on its own, not that good, but when it's coming in a burst, much more manageable. So I like it. We'll have to see how that is. New Brink of Death cluster has been added southwest of the Duelist starting location. Generate 4% of life per second while in low life. I like it. Especially because if you're like a petrified blood build, 4% of your actual life, 4% of your max life is 8% of the actual life you're working with. So that's something to consider as well. Circle of Life added east of the Shadow starting location. Frights gain 10 life per enemy hit with attacks. 12% of damage taken recouped is life. New Excess Sustenance Cluster has been added to the northeast of the Ranger's starting location. 15% chance to gain 200 life on hit with attacks. Interesting. Master Sapper has moved location to make room for that. I don't remember what Master Sapper did. <laughs> Taste for Blood no longer provides 10 life per enemy hit with attacks. Now grants 0.6% of attack damage reaches his life, previously 0.5, and 20% increased maximum total life recovery per second from Leech, previously 10%. Okay. The Devotion Notable Passive Skill no longer provides 5% increased effect of non-curse auras from your skill. Now provides 25% increased effect of Consecrated Ground you create. I believe that is the life node to the west of Templar, so that's pretty good. Stance Clusters. Dance of Blades Cluster has been added to the Southeast Duelist. You have Onslaught if you have changed stance recently. I'm telling you, somebody's going to make a stance changing build, <laughs> and you're going to get Perma Onslaught and Adrenaline by investing into some ridiculous amount of cooldown recovery. Wait, hang on a minute. Blood and Sand gets cooldown recovery rate by itself. And then on quality, another 10%. Um, anything here? No. You just use Enhance or like an Ashes or something. Get an extra half a percent per quality. And yeah. Go to the moon with cooldown recovery rate and get some adrenaline and all that jazz. Season sword play, new cluster, southwest of duelist. Grants 50% increased mana reservation efficiency of stance skills. Stun avoidance clusters. Arcane Sanctuary, that is a 
shield notable north of shadow. No longer has 25% chance to avoid elemental ailments or avoid being stunned. Highly, highly unfortunate. That node was kind of a powerhouse in the right situation, but it was hard to finesse it. Now it has 30% reduced ailment duration on you. Unfaltering no longer provides 50% reduced stun duration on you. Now for 10% of damage taken from stunning hits is recovered as life. Hmm. And 50% increased stun threshold. Interesting. I don't remember where that notable was. Tolerance no longer has 30% chance to avoid being stunned. Now it has plus 19% to chaos resistance. I think that's the one north of shadow. Small passive skill at the entrance tolerance cluster no longer has chance of avoid being stunned. Now it's seven chaos res. Uh, and the corresponding one for stun, yep, 13%. That is indeed the one near shadow. Goliath, notable passive skill. No longer has stun and block recovery. Conjured barrier. Oh, a new conjured barrier cluster has been added to the northwest of which. Wasn't that a cluster notable? I believe so. 30% chance to avoid interruptions from stun while casting. 50% increased block and stun recovery. 30% increased mana rege regeneration rate while stationary. Trial of Faith. 50% increased stun and block recovery. 5% over of ES over 1 second when stunned. And life over 1 second when stunned. Interesting. Successive detonations cluster has been moved to make room for that. Hang on, where is that? Northwest of Witch's starting location is where Conjured Barrier is. There was something called successive detonations over there? That sounds like a mine thing. Hmm. Maybe I'm just not picturing it correctly. Perfectionist cluster added to the northeast of Ranger's starting location. 5% movement speed, 30% chance to avoid being stunned, 50% stun and block recovery. Okay, that's where the stun avoidance went, I guess. One with evil, notable passive skill. Two small passives prior have been removed. Ah, uh, that is uh, the chaos res cluster near Shadow. That is second notable to Natural Authority War Cry cluster. Escalation. If it's 10% increased melee damage for a second, you've been affected by a war cry buff to a max of 60%. Seems pretty strong. Natural Authority now has 20% buff effect instead of 30. Enemies taunted by you take 8% increased damage instead of 6. Uh, small passive changes, not going to go into those. Quality on war cries got buffed, it looks like. Maybe because of some of these things I skipped over. <laughs> um, yeah, looks like it. Two small passive skills no longer provide increased war cry cooldown recovery skill or rate. So it's kind of shifting some of that into other clusters and on the quality, which is a buff in a lot of cases because most people are not picking up these, but anybody can slap on some quality, you know? Ascendancy changes are going to be easier to look at in a more visual form, so here is what Shadow looks like at this point. It is pretty much a decently sized nerf for a lot of builds. So Bomb Specialist over here used to be uh, one of the one point things. <clears throat> used to give you 10% increased damage per trap, and the 25% chance for traps goes to trigger again, and 25% reduced mana cost of traps. All really good. Now it's a lot more general. Hits have 20% chance to deal 50% more area damage. 20% chance to take 50% less area damage from hits. Bit of offense, bit of defense. Less damage than uh, the previous trap thing, but is not specific to traps anymore. Explosive experts over here is the same, still a one-pointer. Same as Born in the Shadows, 15% reduced damage taken from blinded enemies and 
buying stuff. Chain Reaction is the same, but it's a one-pointer now. Same with Demolition Specialist, I believe. And Pyromaniac is a two-pointer. So you have to pick up either Chain Reaction or Demolition Specialist to get to it. Perfect Crime triggers level 20 summon trigger bots when allocated. 35% less damage with triggered spells. Trigger bots, they showed off on stream, will, instead of you triggering skills or your skills triggering from you, they trigger once each from your two trigger bots. It works out to 30% more damage, essentially, and more hits overall, if that's the type of thing you're worried about. Like Clockwork, 30% increased cooldown recovery rate is pretty good. And by, that, and by that I mean it's kind of insanely good. Nearby enemies have 10% reduced cooldown recovery rate. Kind of a niche defensive thing there as well. So there are a couple of things here that you could theoretically pick up uh, pretty easily and make this a very general build, not necessarily specific to a trap or even like a cast on crit build. You could play a an impending doom build. The increased cooldown recovery rate there would be really good for Vixens. Um, assuming that hasn't been nerfed, hasn't haven't looked at that yet. And then you go Born in the Shadows, um, Bomb Specialist, and Perfect Crime. Although, I guess... <laughs> Maybe you don't want Perfect Crime on your Impending Doom build. Because that just wouldn't work out that well, really. Overall, I think this is a nerf to traps, at the very least. I don't know if mines are nerfed, because I don't know how much the old passive propped up Saboteur for mines. Taking a look here, the old one was... Increased mine throwing speed and detonation speed. And the new one, um, the 150% increased effective auras from mines, that's the same. The hinder got nerfed from 40% down to 30%, so it doesn't have increased effect anymore. It's just really unfortunate that Pyromaniac is a uh, four pointer now instead of a two pointer. Uh, I think that makes the whole saboteur tree really awkward because I don't think either Chain Reaction or Demolition Specialist are good enough on their own. And Pyromaniac I don't think is worth four points. So it's it really feels like you're paying four points for like two and a half or three points worth of value, which when you only have eight is... A significant amount. Yeah, it really looks like a a nerf, but a mild one. Assuming perfect crime, the trigger bots don't work for traps <laughs> because they're traps being triggered and not spells being triggered. But the trap technically casts a spell, so I'm assuming it doesn't work like that. But if it does for some reason, then I could see this being really good still, but if it doesn't, which I think is more likely, then I think it's a, a mild nerf, but still a nerf. You probably just eat the nerf, I guess. Um, take Explosive Experts, Born in the Shadows, and Pyromaniac for like an explosive trap build, but I think they have definitely succeeded in making me at least consider other options for a trapper than saboteur. Then Pathfinder has some really interesting things going on here. Nature's Adrenaline, slight nerf here. Flask gained three charges every three seconds. No longer has the chance not to consume charges. Master Surgeon got a complete rework. Life flask, life flask effects are not removed when unreserved life is filled. This is amazing. 50% less life recovery from Flask. That's still pretty amazing. With my uh, minimal uh, setup I had just to 
give a quick like estimate of how much life recovery you could expect from a flask. Even with the 50% less multiplier going on there, I got 985 life recovery from flasks. And that's not regen, that's not leech. And so it bypasses some otherwise painful map mods. So you can scale it way beyond that. There's some people talking about it on Reddit. If you go insanely hard on it, you could potentially be recovering tens of thousands of life per flask use. Now on a per second basis, that's obviously a lot lower, but the point still stands that life recovery is potentially very viable. And because when you go Pathfinder, you want the flask charge gain per three seconds anyways, it's a, you know, a two point node instead of a four point node effectively. Maxter uh, Tox Assist here is the same. Nature's Reprisal got reworked. 25% chance to inflict Withered for two seconds on hit and 50% increased effective Withered. This is really good. I like it a lot better than the previous like AOE and um, attack based chaos damage. I think it's going to be more damage on average overall. We'll have to see how temp chains panned out. Nature's Boon uh, gets the magic utility flask effect up from 20%. Now it has 30%. Used to be on Master Alchemist. Master Alchemist has what used to be on this node, which is chance for a flask used not to consume charges, but 50% instead of 20%. That is obscenely good. I'm pretty excited for that one. Um, rough idea for a build right now. Righteous Fire Pathfinder with Fire Trap using Master Surgeon and Master Alchemist. You go full infinite flasks. You have a life flask, like three elemental flasks. You go full suppression. Or you go with... Um, Two elemental flasks and a jade and granite flask, or one elemental flask, a ruby, and an amethyst flask, you know, whatever you want to do, really. The flexibility of Pathfinder, but potentially very strong defensively in a similar way as Jug. Um, getting a lot of utility from your class, but not necessarily a lot of damage. I think it has potential. Master Distiller is interesting as well, similarly to the flask-based concoction skills. Grant bonuses to non-channeling skills you use by consuming three charges from a flask of each of the following types if possible. Diamond Flask for 150% increased crit chance. Bismuth Flask for 20% Ellie Pen. Amethyst Flasks for 25% Fizz as Chaos. It all seems pretty solid. So, I'm very into those ideas, personally. Interesting to see what people cook up there. Ascendant got some changes accordingly as well. Ascendancy, or the Pathfinder Ascendancy, lost the 4% life recovery because it's on a mastery now. Now it's 25% plant chance for flasks not to consume charges instead of 15%, and removes bleeding when you use a flask, so it retains the three charges every three seconds. Saboteur lost the life regen. It was kind of underwhelming before uh, the Ascendancy Saboteur node and now has 15% increased cooldown recovery rate and hits have a 15% chance to deal 50% more area damage. I think it's pretty solid, honestly. I'm, uh, yeah. I like that change a lot. I think it opens up some potential options for uh, a triggered build with Ascendant if you're not going to go Saboteur. Here's some discussion on the new gems. Prismatic Burst. Large chest on the Twilight Strands now contains Prismatic Burst for Scion. Okay. Interesting. And Combat Focus does indeed work with it. Very interesting. I didn't read about this earlier, but they added a Momentum skill, which... I went back up to read about, but 
it seems there isn't a whole lot in the way of information about what momentum is, but they said it was going to serve a similar function as the onslaught support, which is getting removed. So something of note there that changes the early game. Some skill balances, melee splash got buffed. Blight has less duration, but increased base damage now. Explosive trap, oh. Oh, it got an early game nerf, that's all. <laughs> I was like, did they nerf my boy? Explosive trap now causes three smaller explosions at level one, previously four. Scaling up to seven at gem level 20, unchanged. I wonder if that impacts the scaling beyond level 20 because at level 32, I think it was, you could get 10 explosions, and maybe that changed. Shattering Steel had its damage nerfed early on, and then buffed later on. Okay. Projectiles do up to 50% more damage with hits at the start of their movement, lowering the bonus as they travel, scaling up to 110% at gem level 20, used to be 100% at all levels, so again, more early game changes, but doesn't impact the late game. Splitting Steel has 70% effectiveness at level 1, up to 210% at level 20, unchanged. Lower low level added damage, higher high level added damage. The base projectile speed of Spark has been reduced. Now fires 3 additional projectiles at level 1, previously 4, and 7 at level 20, unchanged. This is one of my predictions that I made in my last video. I said they could reduce the base projectile speed of Spark. So I got that one right at least. Uh, let's see, the timer that prevents Spectral Throw from hitting the same target again has been reduced from 300 milliseconds to 225. That means it can hit the same target more often than before. That's an interesting change, for sure. I don't know if it'll bring people back to such an old skill, but who knows? Lightning Tendrils got buffed by a little bit early on. Well, basically 50% is more than a little bit, I guess. Scaling up to close to a 40% buff. Uh, stronger Pulses no longer deal 200% more damage with hits. Instead, Stronger Pulses always critically strike. Now releases a stronger pulse every three pulses, previously every four. I'm gonna be honest, I don't even know what that is. So. <laughs> Explosive concoction now consumes one charge per projectile fired from one flask of each type, if possible, instead of three. Now deals more added cold damage if pulled out of a sapphire flask across the board. Okay, nice. And more added lightning damage across the board as well. Nice explosive concoction nerf. Poisonous concoction now only consumes one charge instead of two. Uh, and it got buffed? What? <laughs> they, they really buffed this skill? This is like a, a meta leak starter. It now provides added chaos damage equal to 3% a flask recovery amount if charges were consumed, scaling up to 11% at gem level 20, previously 9%. I can't believe they just did that. Interesting. Onslaught support has been removed, placed with momentum. Faster attacks now requires level 8 instead of 18 and scales accordingly, up to where it was before previously. No longer alter... Oh, I see. Yep, quest rewards have changed around as well. Let's see. Sniper's Mark, requirement of level 4 instead of 24. Let's see. Probably got nerfed, right? I should have called this one out. It was in my list, actually, and didn't think to talk about it. Curse enemies take 10% increased projectile damage from projectile hits at level 1, up to 35% at level 20. Okay. And... Okay, same number of splits at level 20 as well. No nerf. Assassin's Mark requires level 16, set of 24. Looks like there's no scaling changes there. Warlord's Mark, 16 instead of 24. Same with Poacher's Mark. And same at the high end, just scaling changes. 
scepters have had their attack speed nerfed, which makes sense for the reasoning they go into. They're supposed to be more caster oriented, so it doesn't make sense for them to have faster attack speed than mace counterparts. They have swapped out some of the... Well, they got rid of the flat elemental damage to spell vendor recipe. Uh, they're targeting a lot of racing changes, like I've mentioned a couple times now, so that makes sense. And they've introduced some base items that have replaced the spell damage implicit with a flat elemental damage implicit, and some high-level versions of those as well. You know, okay change, I guess. I don't know if I'll be using those. The spell damage ones will probably be better a lot of the times for the builds I like to play. But good to have some more variety, I suppose. Okay, Arcane Surge got changed. No longer grants more spell damage, instead grants cast speed. 10% increased cast speed at level 1, up to 20% at level 20. Supported skills now yield 10% more damage, while well, you have Arcane Surge up to 25% at level 20. Higher Fan's Arcane Blessing Ascendancy no longer provides 50% increased effect. Said now provides Arcane Surge grants 20% more spell damage to you. Which could be interesting if you find another way to scale it. Uh, let's see. No longer increased effect there. Oh, it's 20% increased effect of Arcane Surge instead of the previous 10%. So, yeah, that's pretty nice. That 20% spell damage, more spell damage granted, should get scaled by that. Uh, I should have called this one too. It was on everyone's mind. Molten Shell has been nerfed. Miscellaneous player balance. Molten Shell currently outperforms other guard skills without much investment. True. Has a higher ceiling of damage mitigation potential, and it doesn't require that much to get past the point of other skills. Molten Shell now has buff can take damage equal to 10% of your armor, up to a max of 5,000 instead of 20% of your armor, up to a max of 10,000. Fall Molten Shell has buff, can take damage equal to 20% of your armor, up to max of 10,000, previously 30% up to 30,000. Animated weapons no longer randomly pause when moving or attacking. As a result of this change, we've adjusted the attack speed and damage provided by the gem. Should be a net neutral in terms of damage, but result in more consistent damage and clearing. 0% level 1, previously 10% more damage, up to 38% level 20, previously 48. Then some, uh, same deal with more attack speed. Any trigger skills on items that come from a skill gem, such as Reign of Arrows from Lion Eyes Paul, now share the same cooldown group. So using the gem version of the skill should put the triggered version on cooldown and vice versa. That is kind of weird. So you can't use Reign of Arrows yourself if it's being triggered by a <laughs> uh, a skill or by an item that provides the skill. It's kind of weird, but I don't know the intent of them making that. Simplified projectile returning. Previously, some effects that caused projectiles to return specified they only did so at the end of their flight, others only from a final target, and a few from either case. Now, all effects that cause projectiles to return only do so do so in any case that they can. Okay. Projectiles which explode or otherwise destroy themselves only when they cannot move further, such as a fireball, which return will now consistently not do so until after they have returned, just like they don't do so before piercing, forking, or chaining if they have those behaviors. Previously, this was inconsistent. As a general rule, if a projectile wouldn't do something when it pierces or chains from an enemy and continues on, it also won't do that when it hits an enemy and returns from them. Basically, Nimus nerf. Um, they have mechanically nerfed a lot of the skills that people were using with Nemesis to not work that way anymore. Can't say nobody saw it coming, people were definitely predicting it. 
Projectiles from skills would force them to explode or otherwise destroy the projectile before checking for other behaviors, such as concoction skills, will now consistently prevent returning, just like this prevents other projectile behaviors. Projectiles which initially fire at a specific location rather than a direction, such, such as caustic arrows, now ignore this when returning. So they will continue past this, continue past you, until it hit you something. Okay. Hmm, interesting. Fall strike skills can no longer be scored by ancestral call and are no longer affected by stats that cause strike skills to a target additional enemies. Makes sense given the mastery change. They unnerfed power charges. Now 50% increased crit chance. Instead of the 40% it got nerfed to a long time ago. Corruption notable passive skill provided too high of a damage boost than is reasonable for a single notable. Change it so this now provides 20% increased effective withered rather than 35%, which makes the Pathfinder node pretty solid at uh, the 50% increased effect it has now that this has been nerfed to 20% and the mastery went away. Oh, let's see. 319 doubled the value of the aura from Shape or Seed Unique. This is done incorrectly. And only change the displayed values on the item, not the actual values granted. It's been fixed. Will always match what is displayed on the items. Shape received before 3.19 have not yet been updated. The fine orb can still have this done. And will now update the actual function of the item as well as the displayed values. Okay. Totem spawned by players are now killed upon player death. So that people can't cheese boss fights, especially ubers, with totems that won't die, and will linger there for a while while the player is already dead, I'm assuming. Modifier on the Torchoke Step, unique boots that causes totems to reflect 100% of their max life as fire damage, now is a greater radius. Withering Step is now able to be supported by Spell Totem. Why? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> that is an interesting one. It's like the least predictable patch note this game has ever had. Bow attacks, fire, and additional arrow synthesis implicit can no longer roll on bows and quivers. Okay, doesn't affect me at least. That's kind of very high end and rare slash impossible to get in solo cell phone anyways. Elders, hunters, veiled, and crafted belt modifiers that provide a chance for flasks used to not consume charges can no longer roll probably because they buffed Pathfinder up to 50% chance for that now, and they don't want that to be closer to 100%. You know, the more you get, the better. Can no longer create books of regression. Those are the ones that level you down. Existing books will be destroyed when 3.21 is deployed. So no more infinite heist type things. Here's another nerf I predicted. The unique item drop chances for Katarina, the Master of Undeath, have been rebalanced. Also known as Devouring Diadem is probably by far the rarest item. If like this is basically them telling you don't plan on having Devouring Diadem in your league starter. And so I will not be. Some minor rare monster changes. Some Ruthless stuff. Void Stones now upgrade maps in Ruthless. Though the number of tiers they upgrade is less than the base game. Interesting. Eternal Orbs are back in Ruthless. Ruthless no longer has alternative levels for when you start finding 4, 5, and 6 socket items. Yeah, that seems kind of needless anyways. The Time Dilation Notable Atlas Passive in Ruthless no longer causes incursions in your maps to have 33% chance for all monsters to be at least magic. Shaping the seas, mountains, valley, and skies were necessary to prevent your to progress your atlas in Ruthless. Increase the base drop chance for maps in Ruthless, and change these atlas passives so that they now provide maps found to have an 8% chance to be one tier higher instead of 10%. Okay, sounds like some small tweaks. The breach change we mentioned earlier applied the same but differently. Reduced chances for Kirak to offer a unique or synthesized map 
as an available mission in Ruthless. Okay. Rogue Exiles in Ruthless only drop jewelry instead of an item from each for each equipable slot. Interesting decision there, but I'm assuming people mostly did them for jewelry anyways. They nerfed Delve, which alongside the Incursion nerf, those are like the two most common things, so... Special Expedition Logbook Remnants in Ruthless can now have upsides. Special Expedition Logbook Remnants. Ah, I see now. The, like, area-specific ones. Area level of the Temple of Atzawaddle in Ruthless is now the average level of all your incursions. Another temple nerf. Number of chests has been reduced. It that floods betrayal research in Ruthless is now a jewel crafting spree. Price of some items offered by Tujin has been reduced. Drop chance for primordial jewels has been slightly increased. Drop chance for vol orbs increased, that's good. Exonation Ruthless were map, chests, and logbooks but only capable of dropping tier 1 maps. Yeah, people thought that might have been intentional. Um, seems not, though. So glad that's getting fixed. Where Hillock was providing an incorrect reward on research duty in Ruthless. Okay. Alright, here we go. Kirak League mods. This is pretty hype. Abyss. I'm all for it. Three additional essences. Essence, you know, is a solid one. Ambush. Man. This is, <laughs> this whole thing is the all-star map mod selection, isn't it? Everything here is good in some way, except Metamorph. And I guess even Metamorph, you know, somebody's got to love it, right? Harvest for 12 cast, Expedition for 10. Expedition used to be 12 in the past. Um, but, you know, they don't want to have more than one thing the same cost, I don't think. And what are we looking at here? Six mods totaling 12, 24, 42 uh, chaos across six mods. That is pretty good value. Unfortune favors the brave. You'd be paying three chaos for an average of seven chaos with a value. And like I said, Essence, Ambush, those are things you could fit into your atlas anyways and then you run expedition harvest you can run both of those at once in like an early week start scenario um i feel like you're not unhappy to see heist because you're getting the benefits from fortune favors the brave anyways the pack size quantity rarity so the heist on top of that i feel like is just fine so that's four out of six of these that are five out of seven rather that are just good pretty solid I'm ready for that. Uh, Essence is especially nice in Solo Cell Found. I mean, it's good in trade too, but... And then uh, some bug fixes. Yeah, Impending Doom didn't get touched. I think a lot of people are going to be pretty happy about that. Uh, yeah, so that is my two-hour-long ramble about the patch notes and reading of things, and I'm surprised I was able to last this long in terms of my voice, but... Yeah, that'll be about it for now. Hopefully you, let's be honest, nobody has made it this far, but if you did, let me know, because I will personally thank you for it. Um, yeah, anyways, more videos going a bit more in-depth with some of these and some theory crafting coming soon. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you around. Peace.